Okay, then. Um, let's move it on there, on to the, the movie side of things then and how you got involved in that and how you continue to be involved <laughs> in that. So where did that all begin for you? So you began with the Octagon technically, but prior to that. Yeah, well, the only movie I had done before Octagon I'd worked in was uh, a friend of mine, that, well, one of my students, Bob and my students, um, was doing a bit of stunt work. And I think it was through him they wanted to know if I was interested in doubling an actor in a movie called Last of the Knuckle Men, right. which, despite the title, was really about outback opal miners, you know, people who dig holes and get opals. And in Outback Australia, they used to have these, almost set up these prize fights, you know, yeah. in these small towns. And anyway, I ended up doubling this um, actor in that movie. So that was my first taste. As I'd mentioned, you know, uh, Chuck Norris came to Australia in 78. He was doing demonstrations at tournaments that Bob and I were hosting. In fact, Bob was the first one to introduce kickboxing into Australia. Mm -hmm. So I'm demonstrating martial art weapons. Chuck's demonstrating, you know, his Korean martial art. As I said before, we got on really well. He knew I could handle weapons. So off I go to California in 79. And as I said, again, I'm repeating myself, I know, but Chuck was the first person I called because I was like, wow, what an opportunity. And he invited me to his house and we started training every day. He was in pre-production for the Octagon, one of the early kind of ninja movies. He knew I could handle a weapon, so he asked me to play his nemesis, Keo. In fact, four of us, including Chuck's brother Aaron, did all the ninja work, all the fight stuff, because we're all masked. So, you know, we, we, uh, I, I often say that my claim to fame in Octagon was I died eight times. and <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I even said to my mum when she saw it, I said, if you see anybody going splat, it's probably me. Probably you. <laughs> Theo was the main one. And that's what really started a film career. Because, first of all, I'm on the set with some amazing martial artists. Of course, not standing Chuck. And I'm thinking, how good is this? I'm, I met this Tadashi Yamashita, the Ree brothers who are amazing Taekwondo um, teachers. And whole host of others and I thought this is amazing I get to use my martial arts and I get paid for it and I thought what, what an interesting way to live and living so I did a couple more movies with Chuck I ended up working with Chuck in the earlier um, Walker Texas Ranger series and it was a friend of Chuck's who asked me to audition for a movie called Force 5 which was in 1981 Starring, you know, who I, I ended up getting one of the leads with Benny the Jet Urquides yes. and uh, Master Bong Suhan, who's now deceased, but an amazing Hapkido master. Joe Lewis, who is legendary in the karate, early karate days in the US. So once again, I'm on set with, with these amazing martial artists. It was my first lead. That then, of course, snowballed and led on to a whole lot of other roles. Roger Corman movies. I worked in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Hong Kong. Um, and, and mentioning Hong Kong, that was a big, a big turning point for me because I think it was 1984. Well, actually, I was in Japan. And again, I was on tour with Linda Ronster. And I'm in Japan in a little hotel room near Osaka. And the phone rings, God knows how they found me. And this Asian lady says, oh, hey, you know, I work for Jackie Chan. You know, Jackie wants you to come to Hong Kong and work in a movie. What's your price? Wow. <laughs> <That's> my price. <laughs> I said, oh, wait a minute, you know what? And when do you want, when does he want me? Oh, you need to be here in three days. And I said, well, you know, price doesn't matter because that's impossible. I'm on tour and I'm, I'm tied up for another couple of months. So I had to pass on it. And of course, later on that year, I got another call and that was Jackie's people asking me to go and work in Hong Kong on a movie called Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars with the amazing Sama Hong directing, Yun Bill, yeah. who was another amazing actor and martial artist in it. And, and who I found out later, Michelle Yeoh, she played a judo student or instructor in this movie, did a fight with Samo and Andy Lau, both of these people so early in their careers, I didn't even know who they were. And as later on, they, you know, emerged as amazing uh, stars in their own right. So mm -hmm. anyway, that, that also was a big changing career for me because working in Hong Kong is such a different animal than working in America. 
Yeah. But it also gave me a lot of creds working with, you know, the maestros of action movies, especially Asian movies then, working with Jackie and Samo just uh, really helped give me a nice push along, you know, for uh, the American action scene. It was still quite young, you know, as it were. And as I said, it's, it's, it's gone on. It's, it's been an amazing journey. And, and I, you know, to be on set with, again, Jack in a semo, you know, it's, you couldn't get a better classroom. I mean, sure. the stuff you learn about filmmaking, different filmmaking back then. Mm -hmm. It was very over the top, fight scenes were very long. There was no real script at the time. You know, it was choreographed as you went, so you didn't have a chance to rehearse. Mm -hmm. But as anybody knows, even looking back, I was talking to Cynthia Rothrock the other day, and she's looking back on those movies, they still hold up, which is amazing. Yeah, because if I look at a, a, an '80s movie that I did with the action, I'm kind of like, oh god, you know. But <laughs> still, it's what we did back then, so that's okay, you know. But yeah, it was a, it, again another another amazing sort of part of the journey to be on the set in Hong Kong, working under extreme circumstances. Definitely. Um, you've you've sort of already alluded to it, but what were some of the differences then between working in the US? On, on these types of films and then also and then working in Hong Kong? Uh, number one was the hours. See, okay. in the Hong Kong in those days, there were no unions, there was no overtime. So if you went, you know, when I flew over there, I was expecting like, you know, standard 12 hour days. First few weeks I was there, I didn't do much because there wasn't a lot of focus on the drama. Mm -hmm. But once the fight started, and the first fight started with, with Samo, I was on the set 18 hours a day, seven days a week for three and a half weeks to shoot that one fight in Twinkle. So you can imagine how exhausting that. I, I was a lot lighter then, you know, I was probably, I'm talking pounds back then. You know, I probably lost 20 pounds, you know, over the period of three weeks because there was no air conditioning. It was so unbelievably hot in the studio and you're fighting all day long for 18 hours a day. The second thing is, is there wasn't really a script. They would write it as they go. Okay. The third thing is, there's no real rehearsal because they didn't know what, where the fight was going to go or how long it was going to be until they started it. They'd basically do an edit that night and then decide which direction the fight would go, how long it would take and everything else, which by the way, meant that it could be very organic and very spontaneous. They weren't locked in to what we would do in America in a Western movie, you weren't locked into a master. Meaning if you do an American movie, you would have to rehearse the whole thing. You'd have to have it all worked out from where to go before you started shooting. You'd shoot a master of the whole thing and then you'd cover it. You'd do over the shoulder shots, inserts and everything. That was very different. Of course you had a script and you were locked into the script. So there were a lot of variables between the two, which gave you a very different end result, you know? And the final thing I noticed with Samo and the style of shooting was they wouldn't do five takes. Even if you thought you got a perfect take, you would end up doing 20, 30 takes. In fact, Jamie, uh, Jackie was said to me once and he was almost laughing as though he's a little embarrassed. He said he once on a, on a particular sequence of a fight did something like 338 takes oh. on a, just a few moves of a fight scene. But, yeah. <clears throat> He, he realized and they realized that his audiences, they weren't interested in talking heads. They were interested in the action. So all the energy went into creating the best possible action. Whereas the fight I did with Sam over three and a half weeks, six and a half weeks it took to shoot City Hunter fight scene with Jackie. We would have probably spent three days on an American set for the same thing. Yeah. So you understand why you've got such amazing action scenes in the Hong Kong movies because of time. But remember I said, no overtime, no adjustments with the studies. They're on a small monthly retainer so that they could do that, you know? Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so you then went from doing the movies and being in front of them to then moving behind the movies and kind of going behind the cameras. So more into the stunt work, into the action sequences, the planning. Was that a difficult transition to make or was that just a natural progression for you? No, it's very natural because, you know, and again, if you probably heard the, the interview with Cynthia and I, yeah. what we did when we did those films, you hardly ever had a double. Yes, 
occasional gobble in there, but mostly you did it all. And not only did you do it all, you probably did most of your own choreography. Yeah. So I was already kind of being a fight coordinator. The, and so the natural progression for me was, yes, I was already choreographing fights and putting them together. I could do them myself. But one of the biggest, biggest things I think and why I've been successful as a coordinator is having acted in so many movies, sure. albeit some of them very low budget, but still you're acting, you're playing a character, was that I understood the drama and how to beat the, uh, bring the drama beats into a fight. Like if you get somebody like a Scarlett Johansson or a Margot Robbie, you know, they're amazing actors and they would really gravitate to me understanding that side of the screen. Meaning a lot of people, a lot of films you used to have, you'd have drama, 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 the drama stops, then it's a fight scene and then the drama continues. Well, that worked way back when, it doesn't work anymore. You know, you need to have an action scene that is a continuation of the story. It's got to be part of the drama. And I would say to them, a lot of what they're not doing is just as important as what they are doing. Yeah. Meaning, what's their thought process? Are they angry? Are they scared? You know, what just happened before the fight started? And, and so we, 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 we create a drama scene, of course, albeit with action. You know, we used to call action is nonverbal dialogue. Yeah. You know, your dialogue becomes the techniques you're throwing, the ferocity of the, the fight scene, how violent was it, what's the end result, you know, all of that would go into a lot of the action scenes. And again, I think I've had longevity just because of understanding that part of it, not just the physical part of it. Yeah. And, and by the way, you know, I, my friend Guy Norris, Guy Norris, no relation to Chuck, I've worked with Guy since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And Guy was on Lord of the Rings and the very first Mad Max. He's done movie after movie after movie. And thankfully, you know, he brings me on when he gets a job as second unit director, supervising stunt coordinator. He brings me on as fight coordinator. We have an incredible team of stunties, regular guys, a lot of them very young. Yeah. And we use the same ones for obvious reasons. Again, that it's, it's about safety. You need people that you can trust yeah. to work with an actor, put them on a wire, make sure nobody's going to get hurt. Yeah. And so, you know, me being a fight coordinator, I'm still just part of a, an incredible wheel of people, you know, that brings all this stuff together. But I'm, I'm very happy with the whole transition, meaning I probably... Last five years, I did Mad Max Fury Road, did uh, Ghost in the Shell with Scarlett Johansson, X-Men, Dark Phoenix, Triple, F uh, Triple Frontier, Ben Affleck movie. Uh, just finished Suicide Squad. I won't say two because it's, it's more a different take on the original Suicide Squad with James Gunn. And now I'm going into a movie called Slayer, which is kind of a medieval sword picture. And then we're hopefully starting on another Mad Max movie. Now, I may act in some of those, like I did have an acting role in Fury Road, Mad Max, but that's great because I love still the idea of being in front of a camera. Sure. But if I don't, that's okay too because if you think about it, I, you know, I like to say to people, all I wanted to do with my life was be the best martial artist I could be. Everything good in my life has happened as a result of that, which I've said over and over, the bodyguard work, traveling the world, you know, doing movies. So it's a pretty good through line. So even doing the fight coordinating, I'm still a martial artist. I'm still, you know, using my martial arts and helping create things that are very much in line with my life passions. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, and a bit like I was talking about with the rock and roll stars, I get to meet such incredible people. Like to go and train Will Smith at his house for months before we did the first Suicide Squad sure. and get to know what an amazing person Will is. You know, he's, he's so smart and he's such a giving person. He, you know, when you do a movie with Will, his biggest push is that everybody has a great life experience, sure. not just make a movie. Yeah. And he'll go out of his way to make that happen. And you, so to see, to see that, that, that human side to someone like a Will. And I love to talk about Margot. You couldn't get a nicer, more down to earth little Aussie chick than Margot. It's my future and wife, I might add. Excuse me? My future wife, though. <laughs> <laughs>
I know another tough gig, right? <laughs> but you know, he and so committed. You know, he, again, it's like when I was talking about Keith Richards. You get a Margo or a or a Will or a Scarlet. When you train them, there's a difference when somebody comes to you to be trained for a movie and they've been told by the producers they have to do it, and somebody who comes with such a hunger to want to actually do it themselves and be the very best they can be. Yeah. And oh man, that's, you know, that's just, it's like an aphrodisiac because, you know, I love that. And, and when they realize that all my job is, is to try and make them look the best they can look on screen. That's my only agenda, yeah. you know, uh, then it, then it usually turns out to be a really good relationship and often friendship and, you know, and again, same as with the rock and roll people, to see the real person, the people behind those characters that you see them play on screen is is amazing. Do you ever get starstruck with them? No, I don't. You know, um, I've probably been around so many stars that I, and because again, I've had a chance to see them as the real people, mm -hmm. I already know that there's going to be another side to them. I tell you though, I, you know, there's been a couple of times that's happened. Like when I went to America, I was living in uh, Malibu, you know, with uh, Linda Ronstadt and, and then her manager, Peter Asher, you, you'd be too young, but Peter and Gordon were in a massive duo in English pop way back they were as big as the Beatles at one stage well anyway they're English Peter uh, was uh, managing me and I lived in Malibu anyway I went to a little coffee shop at one stage and again this is in the early 80s that used to be in the Malibu colony and they're sitting in the corner is Paul Newman and I was starstruck because <laughs> I just idolized Paul Newman as an actor you know and as a person so that, and the only other time was when I, because it was early in my career, uh, I'm working on Octagon and Lee Van Cleef is in the movie. Now, if you've, you know, seen some of those old spaghetti westerns, Lee Van Cleef was, was a huge character in those days. And to be around Lee, I think I was like a little kid, you know, in a, <laughs> in a candy shop. But overall, I, I of course respect them and their status because you have to especially when you're on a movie set you know I often say that how you're treated depends on where your name appears on the call sheet yeah. so you realize that yes there's a pecking order but once you break those barriers and get to sort of work with them one-on-one -on -one, and like I said they understand that you're just there to help them and I would expect the same sort of respect back yeah. Which, which generally happens, then it's it's a, it's a nice marriage, you know. So it's good. Fantastic. I should, um, Mar should you mention Margot? Yeah. <laughs> um, you said then that you've had an amazing career in the martial arts. Um, you're still training now. You're still very active in training. If that, if I, if I'm correct in thinking that, um, has you changed? Has your training adapted and changed as you've kind of gone from your twenties to thirties to forties to fifties to now, etc. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that age does, age will kind of, by its own nature, change what you do and how you do it. I don't, you know, one of the things I do is I try and be consistent, you know, like I try and be very consistent in my training, meaning that if I'm doing a movie or whatever, then of course, 14 hours a day on the set, the best you can do is maintain. But once I finish the movie, I put a lot of work into my training. You know, I've, I've added a lot of little strings to the bow in, you know, I've been doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for the last 30 plus years. Yeah. Managed to get a fifth degree black belt, which, which I, I feel very proud of. Yeah. All of that, the karate, I still do the kickboxing, you know, I'm very much into reality based martial arts. You know, I teach a lot of seminars and that. So as a result of that, I have to keep my skill set up, but not only do I have to, it's essential for me to do. And I, I, I'm almost too scared not to, because I'm scared I like it too much, just laying around a little bit and, and smelling the roses, you know, because I, you know, I'm very much into weight training as a supplement to what I do. You know, my wife and I are into fasting. We're on, you know, plant-based diets at the moment, vegan diets. So we're very aware of health because I do want to still be training in another 20 years from now, you know all being well and i i really want to stay true to being a martial artist i don't want i don't believe you couldn't 
I don't believe you could look at me and call me a martial artist if I hadn't trained in the last year or two years. I, you could say I used to be, but you need to be, you know what I mean? So, so that means I need to be trained. I need to keep myself up to date. This is one of the reasons I like doing seminars. It's because it really kicks you in the bum because I know every time I do one, especially at my age, that probably a lot, a lot of them, oh, I see if Norton slowed down a little bit, you know, all of this. So that kind of fear of how you might be besieged is a good thing. Gus D'Amato says, fear is a friend of extraordinary people. That fear motivates me to get into the gym, to train a little harder, to make sure my skills are up to scratch yeah. so I can go out there and still be a role model. So, so in answer to your question, yes, yes, yes. And I, I try and do as many seminars with different um, martial arts masters or teachers when they come to camp when I can because I very much like to add to what I do. Mm -hmm. I often say that you ask me am I different? I've often said that I do not want to be the same martial, martial artist today that I was five years ago. Yeah. Because if I'm the same martial artist then I'm just repeating a pattern. I want to evolve. I want to, I want to change my feeling and my expression of martial arts and the only way I can do that is to keep reading to keep research and keep up to date with different other martial arts masters especially young ones that are coming through that have different ideas on training methodologies and all of that and and it keeps me hungry and it keeps me passionate and it keeps me I often say that as martial artists you have a chance to learn something new every day of your waking life should you have the desire there's, there's always something new to learn. Well, how good is that considering, as you've heard me say a lot, most people are probably just living with pre-learned skills, what they learned as a kid, learn to ride a bike, play cricket, play football. There's not a lot of people, and I'm generalizing, of course, as some do, but not a lot of people will take and challenge themselves mentally and physically in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Definitely. As a martial artist, you can do that, and, and I love that challenge, you know, so, yeah. Perfect. Um, which area do you enjoy the most at the moment, then, in studying the martial arts? You said you've got your fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you've come from a karate background, um, you have your weapons that you're you're obviously very good at as well. So is there a particular area that um, at the moment you like to study? Does it change? Do you have a consistency in what you like to train? You know, it does change. You know, I was very, very uh, engrossed in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because it's so complex. And one of the reasons I like the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and we say Brazilian because the origins were ja in Japan, but yeah. the difference with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is that it allows itself and has allowed itself to evolve yeah. almost week by week, month by month. In other words, what we were doing five years ago in BJJ is very different to what you need to do today. In other words, leg attacks, heel hooks, knee bars, all of that. We didn't do any of that when I started Jiu Jitsu. And that's a bit of an evolution. So it's very fresh. It keeps up with the times that, of course, the UFC's had a big part in that. A lot of the competitions have had a part in that and keeping up to date which is very different from a lot of traditional arts that stay the same by the mere nature they call themselves traditional. They want yep. to stay and preserve what they did 100, 200 years ago, whatever it might be. Having said that, like for instance, coronavirus, you know, I'm doing um, some Zoom classes for Zendikai. And because you have to be on the map by yourself, I've, I've sort of revisited a lot of the kata, the breathing kata of Sun Chin. And I've gone back and looked at old notes and everything I had. And I'm loving it because I, I, I don't allow as much time on that kind of training. Yeah. Because there's only so many hours in the day. I love hitting the bag. I love kickboxing. You know, I love boxing. And I love the jiu-jitsu and the reality-based training. But I've just renewed my love for what I did 20 years ago, you know, which is, which is great. Benny Okides, Benny the Jet, who's one of my real role models, has a great saying. He says, forget what you know, remember what you've forgotten. And it's true. We've probably forgotten 70, 80, even 90% of what we have learned in our life. To go back and, and, and re revisit that is, that's been fantastic for me. I'm loving that. Good. Um, kind of wrapping it up then, I suppose, because I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, in terms of role models then, you've mentioned Benny the Jet. 
Which other role models do you think have really influenced you in your career as a martial artist and also in, in the film work? Oh, well, the film work, again, like I mentioned, the Margots of Will Smith. And again, the reason is because of the, of the level of excellence they demand of themselves, they, their ability to commit and not just be mediocre. I've often said my least favorite word in the English language is mediocrity, meaning, oh, I'm good enough, I'm okay. You know, if you take that attitude, you're pretty much gonna sleepwalk your way through most things. I've always said excellence is unattainable, but the journey toward it is not. And, and those sorts of people are role models because I see them always striving to be better, you know, and taking on jobs that frighten them. You know, a lot of them, will take on roles really because it just scares them and their ability to be able to carry it off. Sure. I, I love that they will jump in, you know, and, and take that on. Chuck Norris, of course, is always, he's a dear friend. You know, I love telling people Chuck was best man at duty in my wedding. Yeah. That's because we're scared in case anyone calls any shit at the reception, Chuck would be able to handle it. But he's, a, he's had been a dear friend for 40 plus years and mm -hmm. Chuck the role model in the sense that always when I was with him, he was the same. There was never a time he wasn't trying to find somebody in the martial arts world that could teach him something new to help him be better. So he, would, he trained as hard as anybody back in the day, you know. So there's that. I mean, there's, there's a lot, you know, but there are a few that come to mind. Bob, of course, Bob Jones, my, my dear friend of 50 plus years. Bob is 80 years of age now. Again, he'll want to beat me up for telling people <laughs> that. But um, Bob still, he's eating one meal a day. He's trying fasting in a radical fashion, you know. He's on different diets. He's doing this Wim Hof breathing, which okay. I don't know whether you've heard of it. It's yeah. a very very interesting sort of form of breathing. So in other words, he's also a role model that still at 80, if anyone could be forgiven for just resting on their laurels, but he's always trying to find some way to tax himself and do something new. Yeah. So he's another role model. You know, my wife, she's a role model for me. You know, she does yoga every morning at five o'clock for two hours, yeah. always trying to work out different ways to improve herself. So yeah, I, I, I feel like I've got lots of examples, you know, around me that, that can yeah. serve as really, really constructive role models. Fantastic. And finally then, what's the plans for the future? So obviously at the moment, coronavirus has hit. So we're all kind of stuck inside a little bit. We were talking before it began about Victoria just releasing or just starting to release now, haven't they? Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. No, it, yeah. As I said to you earlier, uh, Dan, I, I'm, I'm happy at the moment. And again, I don't want to sound that can sound bad meaning i'm i'm I, I my heart goes out to people who either lost loved ones lost their jobs lost their schools sure. but if you're asking me personally you know i'm i'm at that stage of life regardless of what we talk about at all this training and work that i really really ch cherish the downtime I, I cherish the time to just not have a calendar full to just enjoy reading researching which i like to do maybe getting on cnn i'm kind of addicted to american politics but, you know, <laughs> to give myself time to catch up on a lot of stuff that normally i wouldn't get a lot of time for so i'm liking that as I said, we have a movie called Slayer that a friend of mine is producing that hopefully will go as soon as things relax a bit. Mad Max is, is a huge, huge movie coming up. And who knows after that, maybe I'll be getting too old, but maybe not too, you know? Yeah, Again, it's, it's cool to still be working in the industry after all this day. So it's important that I, I keep trying, keep myself healthy, keep myself fit and and not give in <laughs> you know i'd love to finish it off because there was a um i saw a little somebody sent me a little clip of, of somebody asked clint eastwood they're on a movie set clint i think is 88 or something I, I forget how old he is and they said how do you do it what motivates you what keeps you going and he said the secret is i never let the old man in Right, yeah. I mean, he doesn't accept the idea that age is supposed to mean that you can no longer perform or, or achieve or whatever. And there was a country and Western singer that wrote a song based on that story about not letting the old man in, you know, which I think is fantastic. So, listen, we, you know, Benny, Benny again would often say, Benny Okides would say, I never want to, I'll never utter the words to myself, 
I'm getting older, I've got to slow down, I've got to start taking it easy because he believes, as I do, that you give yourself a psychological crutch yeah. to lean on, to then never really feel you have to participate fully anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a it's a downward slope then I think I think we've just gotta we've just gotta keep going until we can't, you know. To finish off then, what do you think about Tyson stepping back into the ring potentially? Have you seen him training? Oh man, who hasn't? You know, oh frightening. Frightening. Terrifying. Right. Right. At 53, I, still terrifying. Yeah, I, I can't imagine he will get in the ring. I know he's maybe interested in some demonstration matches. Some exhibition matches, maybe. Or, yeah. yeah, because, you know, you, if the idea of still getting, yes, he can punch, but I think he would admit that after half a round, he'd probably be huffing and puffing like anybody. Mind you, if he hit you with any of those shots, you know, good Half a round would matter, yeah. It's very inspirational to see. It's quite chilling to see. I often think, being into reality based stuff, I mean, one of those shots with a bare knuckle would be like, good night, you know, it, yeah. it's fantastic. And I'm, I'm thrilled because he, he, not that long ago, he did an interview with Joe Rogan where he said he, he, he doesn't even know that person. Who was that yeah. person? Yeah. He doesn't even relate to his boxing career to see maybe that passion coming back in that area. I mean, that's fantastic. That's exciting. And I, I Again, that, that one clip alone, I think, has inspired so many people, you know. Yes, yeah, definitely. Hey, 53 is, again, it ain't over till it's over. It's only yeah. over if you get it, say, you know, you say it is. So. As you just said, yeah. 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 And, and there's a bit, I just read there's an Australian promoter, a boxing promoter friend that I know. He's uh, offered, apparently offered Tyson like a million dollars to come out and just do a demo yeah. match here in Australia. So... Who knows? Yeah, interesting for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much again for taking the time out to speak to us. I really appreciate it, Richard. It's always an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Um, an absolute gentleman. Thank so thank you. you. I it. Yeah. Okay. We'll, thank we'll you. do it again. You check yeah, in with me in a couple of years and we'll update everything. Yeah, that sounds good to me. So stay safe. I hope this um it all calms down eventually uh, and we can get back to, to doing what we love and training properly. Yeah, it will. And to all friends out there and everything again it, it will eventually just be a hiccup albeit and not a not a not a nice one to remember but we will get through it you know and there's always an upside there's got to be an upside yeah. you know just to be able to spend time at extra time at home with family with friends with loved ones you know providing you have that sort of base at home that in itself is a wonderful thing and i think we should cherish at least the upside of, of what this is providing, you know, albeit there's an incredible downside too, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I just don't want people to always go into the woe is me. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, I can't go out. I can't do this. Yeah. You know, come on. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. Okay, See you, my friend. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.